What a play, right? You're watching that, you just couldn't believe it. Couldn't believe it, right? Just, just off the goal line, 25 seconds, down by four points. Everyone thought a sure touchdown. Russell Wilson, great quarterback, is going to throw in the wide receiver, Ricardo Laquette, intercepted by Patriot defender Malcolm Butler. Some saying the worst play in NFL history. Bad. Bad. Now, Russell Wilson is a Christian, and Russell Wilson goes to a church, he's part of a church that a friend of mine, Tim, Ru Tim White, pastors in suburban Seattle. And he has a lot of the like, Seahawks and members of his church, actually. He's kind of an unofficial chaplain to them. So he uh, sent me something, Russell Wilson, the poor quarterback in that play, posted it on uh, his Facebook page the day after. He, he posted that poem. Actually, I have it somewhere. Where is it? I think it's in my folder. Can you get that for me? That's not great. And this is what this is what he had to say. This is what he had to put down. Poor guy. Anyway, when things go wrong as they sometimes will, when the road you're trudging seems all uphill, when the funds are low and the debts are high and you want to smile but you have to sigh, when care is pressing you down a bit, rest of you must, but don't you quit. Life is queer with its twists and turns, as every one of us sometimes learns. And many a fellow turns about when he might have won had you stuck it out. Don't give up though, the pace seems slow, you may succeed with another blow. Often the goal is nearer than it seems to a faint and faltering man. Often the struggler has given up when he might have captured the victor's cup. And he learned too late when the night came down how close he was to the golden crown. Success is fitted or turned inside out, the silver tint in the clouds of doubt. And you never can tell how close you are, it might be near when it seems afar. So stick to the fight when your heart is hit. It's when things seem worst that you must not quit. Well, there's always next year to see how Russell gets it. Hey, wow. Wow. The lesson of life for all of us, you know, what life is all about, really. Because um, one of the foremost temptations, one of the most foremost things in life is the temptation to give it up, to quit, when things are going against us. Um, and maybe things haven't turned out as you planned and hoped for. Maybe there's little, if any, progress in areas of your life you expected. And there are setbacks, disappointments, and you become discouraged and disillusioned, maybe depressed. In our text this morning, we're returning to Isaiah, second Isaiah, chapter 40. This is a turning point in this message to the people of Israel. It begins with those wonderful words that we all know, comfort, comfort, my people, says your God. Now the first 39 chapters of Isaiah have not been so good. They are full of woes and warnings to God's people for their disobedience, their failure to live up to their calling. And God threatens them with destruction, uh, with their enemies overwhelming them. Now it's happened. Now they're in exile, captives in Babylonia. Their spirits are crushed. Their dreams are dashed. Their hopes have been turned to dust. And they become weary and waiting for God to do something. Now this is part of a longer address in which the prophet seeks to rehabilitate the concept of God for his people. Now when the Babylonians overran Judah and took their best and brightest into bondage, the Jews thought that the Babylonian gods were stronger than the God of Israel. And here the prophet reminds them of the power and authority of God over all creation and the human rulers and their ways. And more than that, he goes on to assure them that God has not given up on them, despite all appearances to the contrary, despite his seemingly silent, seeming silence and unconcern. Not only is he able to rescue them, he will do it. And this passage ends with that well-known and beloved promise giving, about God giving strength to the faint and powerless to them. So that those who wait on the Lord, those who rely on God, will have a sustaining vigor that exceeds anything humanly comparable. They spread their wings and soar like eagles. They run and don't get tired. They walk and don't lag behind, or some translations say faint. They don't faint. 
Now, I don't know about you, but I've often wondered about the order of these phrases, you see. I'm not sure I would have put them that way. Um, in our minds, I think the natural progression would be, would be this. You walk, and then you run, and then you soar, right? Walk, run, soar. But he reverses it. So you soar, you run, and then you walk. Right? Well, all of us soar occasionally in life, if we're lucky, right? Some exciting event occurs in our life. We have the achievement of some significant goal. Someone shows us a surprising act of kindness, whatever it is. And then at that moment, life is one day glorious. Wow! But we can't sustain that all the time. It's not realistic. And some of us can run. At least we can run for a while. But we do get tired over time. <laughs> we do. I think the walk and not lag behind or not faint is where most of us spend much of our time. At least I spend a lot of my time here. The walk and not faint. I remember Howard Hendricks, who was a professor at Dallas Theological Seminary for, uh, I think, 150 years, Wayne, wasn't he? Wrote a lot of books, did a lot of things on leadership. And they said, how do you want to be remembered, prof, when you die? And he said, tell them I was a plotter. <laughs> a plotter. You see, life is not one mad dash to the finish line. It's often a wearisome, repetitive plodding along. Trying not to faint. That's enough. Ever feel like that? Weary, get tired, want to quit. I have. I do. I do. Isaiah, think of it, had a whole nation of people who felt like that at the end of the road. And then God's promise comes to them. Hey, listen. God doesn't come and go. God lasts. God doesn't get tired. And God energizes those who do get tired. You, you and me, you and me, the promise is for. Now how does that work? How do we find the power, power to carry, carry on when resources are depleted and with fatigue and hope is sagging? Well, over 20 years ago, I met a, a wonderful man, a, a pastor, who I became friends, and he became a mentor of mine, Donald Morgan. He lived in Weatherfield, Connecticut, a suburb of Hartford. He had a beautiful church. He was an amazing older man. He passed away last year at the age of 90. And I uh, spent a lot of time with him over the years in an organization I was part of. And when I met Don, uh, I felt I was at the end of things here. I felt alone and I felt discouraged. And he spent time with me. And he spoke into my life something based on his own experience in ministry. Not what I was going through, but what could happen and what could be. And he gave me five things to focus on. So I dusted them off <laughs> lately to go back and revisit these things because I knew they were true at the time and I wanted to share them with you. And these were the things that Don said sustained him in ministry and sustained him in life when he was tired and weary and wanted to give up. First he said this, check your fatigue factor. Check your fatigue factor. Maybe you're just tired and you're worn out and you need rest. You know, frequently when we get discouraged and we feel equipped to face life, the root of the problem is simple fatigue. I know that in myself. We've allowed ourselves to get exhausted, physically, emotionally, or both. We've neglected our rest. We haven't taken time out. There's no change of scenery in our lives. And physically and emotionally we're spent and we decline in our output and outlook. Now, I, I, first time I met our dear mayor, the best mayor in the world, <laughs> Mayor Nenshi, somewhere up there. There he is. And we met at this luncheon, and I admire him so much, right? And he came to this noon hour luncheon, and he said, this is my sixth appointment today. I started at six this morning, and I go to midnight. And I'll have like 12 meetings before the day's out. And I say, you do this every day? And he goes, yeah, just about. And I was tired just hearing about that. I don't know that, <laughs> right? That's, wow. Where does he get his energy? I don't know. But I was weary just spending time. This man is amazing. I can't maintain that. Uh, 
Daily living is tiring. Okay, thanks, Heather. Yeah. So, in fact, somebody said, the problem with daily living is, is it's so daily. <laughs> that's, that's the problem. Rick Warren says, sometimes the most spiritual thing you can do is get some sleep. <laughs> right? Some of you like that. But as a nation, we know we're sleep deprived. You know, there's hardly a week goes by that we don't see something in the media about how sleep deprived we are and how our very lives are hanging in the balance if we don't learn to rest more. Inadequate rest impairs our ability to think, handle stress, maintain healthy immune systems, and moderate emotions. And as we age, it's likely to be more of a problem. I admit I don't get a lot of sleep on a regular basis. And I know it affects my judgments, my moods, at times. And that's not a time to make important changes or great decisions, I've discovered. Not a good time. I remember Mark Buchanan wrote this great book, The Rest of God, which is just a, like a, uh, I don't know, prescription for my soul. He talks about the concept of Sabbath rest, right? And he says, what is the Sabbath for? He says, the Sabbath is for doing what you're not required to do. It's the one day or the one time or the one time of a day when you don't have to do what's necessary and that don't do what's necessary. Rest. Do something different. When you're looking down on life and tend to quit, check the fatigue factor. Give yourself a break from the ops. Right? Some of us suffer from hardening, hardening of the arteries <laughs> in life. It's true. Second, he said, review your objectives. That was good advice for me at the time, so I didn't have any. What after all do you want? What are your hopes and goals? Are they still valid? Are they worth seeking? Do you really want to give up on them? Maybe you've lost sight of some objectives and you allow them to recede into the shadows even though they remain as sound, as legitimate, and inviting. Recollect them. Reinstate them. Reaffirm them, he said to me. You know, often in the day-to-day -day grind of work, we're drawn into the tyranny of the urgent. We become myopic. We lose sight of the big picture. And what I can believe we're here to accomplish. We pull back. We need to pull back at times. There's still many things to hope to do and see. Now Morgan, uh, as a young man, before he went into ministry, was going to be a professional singer. He studied hard in New York. He had a promising career ahead of himself. He studied voice. But he found challenges when he was singing and practicing. And one of the challenges was sometimes he found it difficult to have the breath to get through a long phrase. Do you ever have that problem up there? <laughs> Never, Diana says no. <laughs> Sustaining throughout to the end of the long phrase, right? And he couldn't do it in this one piece and he asked the teacher how to handle the situation and she said to him, think to the end before you start. Think to the end, the end of the phrase. And he said it worked, it helped. And whenever he's confronted such a challenge, not only is singing, he says, I think to the end. It's another way of saying, focus on the objectives. And Don took a church that was old and just declining and turned it into one of the largest churches in, in New England. Yeah. What are we as a congregation called to accomplish this year, friends? What are God's objectives? What are God's goals and hopes for us for 2015 beyond? Are we thinking to the end? We need renewed energy to discover and dream and pursue those things together. Third, recover the power of your original inspiration. That's what he said to me. And that was great advice. Somewhere back there, there's a moment of clarity. There's vision, a moment of inspiration. When your perception was clearest and your outlook was sharpest and you felt sustained and the surge of power that you could see it through. Everyone has that somewhere in their life. Now, the Apostle Paul often told of the moments of greatest inspiration on the road to Damascus when he was transformed. Um, when Jesus Christ spoke to him. And that single event drove and sustained him the rest of his life. And near the end of his life, he stood before King Agrippa and he said this, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. 
kept the power of that vision alive to the end. And so, so must we. Another time to Timothy, stir up the gift of God which is in you. Stir up that earlier inspiration which needs to be inbreathed. Recover that. None of us here probably had the blinding revelation that Paul did. But somewhere God has spoken, God has revealed God's self. When Berkeley Reynolds, my minister, placed his hand on my right shoulder in March, March of 1974, and in that moment opened something entirely off the radar screen that I would do with the rest of my life. And here I am. Here I am. A single touch and a few words. And I changed paths and entered my studies for ministry. I need to recover that. I have today and I will in the future. Because he still, over 40 years later, contacts me, prays for me, and encourages me. That'll take you a long way, won't it, in your life, right? Now, Don's Church, First Church of Christ in Weatherfield, Connecticut, was built in 1635. Now, we think we have an old building. <laughs> 1635. Congregationalists, right? New England congregations. And it's a beautiful church. It's, it's classic. It's, it's got the box pews and a pulpit that gives everybody nosebleeds when they get up there. <laughs> I mean, no, it's scary standing in that pulpit. It's... And the church was growing and they needed more space, so they wanted to build a, a new addition. So they built this beautiful addition, but between the original church and the addition is the graveyard. So the road that ran through the graveyard in the middle, that's where they built their passageway to the new building. It's beautiful. It's glass right there, you know. And he would sometimes say to his elders, you know, we're literally six feet away from death. <laughs> but he says, every day I pass along that passageway and I would look out at those grave markers and stones going back to the 1600s. Imagine this. The founders of that church, the saints of God who built that ministry and mission. And I would read their names and the dates of their birth and death and what they were noted for, and I would thank God for them. I would thank God for them. They sustained me, their memories, what they had built on, their lives. The second great awakening in America started in his church, spiritual awakening. Recover the original inspiration. It's important for all of us to do that, friends. Who in your life has been your inspiration and presence? We all have. We all have. Right? Those whom God placed in your path to encourage and motivate and be an example. Fourth, keep up your persistence. Don't lose the benefit he told me of old-fashioned, dogged perseverance. Can win the day when all else fails. And then he sent me this poem by President Calvin Coolidge. Nothing in the world can take the place of persistence. Talent will not. Talent will not. Nothing is more common than successful men with talent. Genius will not. Unrewarded genius is almost a problem. Education will not. The world is full of educated derelicts. Persistence and determination alone are omnipotent. The slogan. Press on has solved and always will solve the problems of the human race. There it is. Right there. Now most of us have never heard of Bill Broadhurst. He entered the Pepsi Challenge 10,000 meter road race in Omaha, Nebraska many, many years ago. Ten years before that he had a, a surgery for an aneurysm in his brain. He was paralyzed on his left side. And now on a misty July morning early he stands with 1,200 live looking men and women at the starting line. And the gun cracks and the crowd surges forward and Bill throws his stiff leg forward and pivots on it as his right foot hits the ground. A slow plop, plop, plop rhythm seems to mock him as the pack fades into the distance. Sweat rolls down his face. 
pain pierces him, but he keeps going. Six miles and two and a half hours later, he finishes. And then a man approached him from a small group of bystanders, one of the participants. And he recognizes him from his pictures in the paper. It's Bill Rogers, the famous marathon runner. And here, Rogers' sister, putting his newly won medal around Bill's neck. You've worked harder for this than I have. As Broadhurst experienced, Christian race is not a competitive event to see who comes in first, but an endurance run to see who finishes faithfully. And the message, friends, is when we're weary, when we're tempted to quit, don't lose the benefit of old-fashioned, dogged persistence. <coughs> Keep up your persistence. And finally, sense the enveloping presence of God. Bask in His Spirit. Become open to the inflating of His power and grace. Realize again and again that around you and in you and through you is a divine force which can hold and sustain you always to the end. What did you say, Paul? I am convinced that you began a good work and you will complete it, will carry it on to completion in the day of Christ Jesus. One of my favorite authors, Frederick Bickner, says this. What about when prayer goes unanswered? Just keep praying. Keep on beating a path to God's door because one thing you can be sure of is that down the path you beat with, even your halting prayer, the God you call upon will finally come and even if he does not bring you the answer you want, he will bring you himself. And maybe it's at the, uh, the, maybe the secret of all prayers, that's what we are really praying for. Absolutely, this above all we can count on. That holding us up and keeping us from quitting is the enveloping presence of God. I believe that. And never allow that consciousness of that to abate. Wait upon the Lord. You will renew your strength. I thought of this the other day. What it might it mean? Wait upon the Lord. And then I thought of a waiter. A waiter in a restaurant. A server. What does a waiter do? Serves, waits on customers, takes their order, and fills their order with dignity and patience. Perhaps that defines what waiting on God is. Not passive sitting about, expecting God to do something and show up, but actively serving despite the struggles and the weariness and the doubts. Wait upon God. <laughs> For God will come. And that God revealed in Jesus Christ. Though Jesus was tempted at the critical hour, never quit on us. He had soared in life at the beginning. In his baptism in the waters of the Jordan, on the Mount of Transfiguration, how could you get better than that? Soared like on wings like an eagle. <laughs> and then he'd run the race set before him, faithfully. And finally, for the joy that was set before him, at the end of his life, he walked. Right? He soared, he ran, he walked, bearing the cross. Enduring it, paying that awful price, because you and I are his joy. And we might find in him the power to carry on. Let's pray. Gracious God, we thank you that you never, as the psalmist says, you never grow tired or weary or even doze. You always alert, and that your eyes are always upon us, your beloved. Lord, we get tired, we get weary in life. We need to find the power to carry on when our hopes are shrinking away, when the struggles are great, when the future is uncertain. We need to remember these things. Thank you for my friend Don. What a faithful man, to the very end of his life, preaching the gospel. Preaching to the age of 90 years of age. That's lasting, Lord. That's enduring. Thank you for all those who've inspired us. And sometimes we need to go back and rediscover that original inspiration. That person or those persons. That cloud of witnesses that surround us, cheering us on in our race of life. We all have them. We all have them. And to keep a track of our objectives, what we're all about in life. And to measure our fatigue factor. Sometimes we're just tired and we need to just take a break. Take a break and rest and do what is not necessary or expected.
spend time with you and to sense your enveloping presence. May we remember some of these things this coming week and weeks before us. Guide us, use us in your service in Jesus' name.